Have you ever begun a project that never was finished? Anybody out there, you've started something, maybe right now at home, you have a project that you had started at some point and you're gonna get to it eventually and it's still there. I told you a couple of months ago that I started reorganizing and cleaning out and redoing the garage. And I'm still working on it. It's not done quite yet, but I'll get to it eventually. And there's some famous examples of people that started projects that never finished those projects. One such example is that in 1916, the city of Cincinnati issued $6 million worth of bonds. That's worth approximately $170 million in 2023 in order to build a 16-mile subway system. Anybody out there from Cincinnati? Uh, no, not a single Cincinnati person. Uh, if you've ever been to Cincinnati, then you would know. They don't have a subway in Cincinnati. Uh, they do have two miles, though, of a subway tunnel, but then they abandoned the rest of the project in 1928. $170 million worth of tunnel. It was supposed to go 16 miles that only went two miles, and this is what it looks like today, which if you're trying to make a creepy horror movie would probably be a great location. They started a project, when you start a project, everybody gets excited, everybody wants to participate, everybody likes the idea, but they never finished the project. We do that in our own lives as well. I remember when the movie Mighty Ducks came out, I decided at that age I was going to be a professional hockey player. Now, I lived in Texas, there is no ice in Texas. But I had roller skates and for about six weeks I was practicing and I was skating around on my street and I had a tennis ball and a hockey stick. And then six weeks later, I kind of got bored of it and stopped. That is until Mighty Ducks 2 came out. And then I was back on my street for another six weeks before eventually quitting. We start things, but so often we don't see them through. Nehemiah is an amazing story for a whole lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is because he has a vision, he sees brokenness, he steps into brokenness, but he doesn't stop. He doesn't just get people excited about something, he sees them complete the vision. They realize the vision that God had for the wall inside of Jerusalem. Uh, look what it says in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15. It says, so the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month of Elul in 52 days. It was a hard 52 days. It was a challenging 52 days. There was lots of opposition. There was plenty of opportunities to quit. Now, I'm sure that the excitement that they started with in building the wall evaporated pretty quickly. And yet, they finished the wall. Now, here's something interesting to put that into context. Uh, there are no miracles in the book of Nehemiah. Now, don't get me wrong. God is in the book of Nehemiah. He's behind the scenes. He's making everything work. He is in control. But when we think of big Bible miracles, the burning bush, the parting of the Red Sea, walking on water, the sun standing still in the sky, none of those things take place in the book of Nehemiah. There's not a spiritual, supernatural miracle that accomplishes the work. It's God working in and through Nehemiah and the people of Israel. So how? Have you ever had a crazy vision, crazy idea, want to do something great and amazing? How do you accomplish those things? Well, Nehemiah gives us very practical steps. That first, Nehemiah demonstrates a life of prayer. Nehemiah pursues the vision that God has given him. He doesn't stop. He stays disciplined. He works hard. And then Nehemiah recognizes what his priorities are, and he maintains those priorities above all the distractions that might get in the way. So let's start by talking about prayer in the book of Nehemiah. Now, I know probably you've heard a pastor talk about prayer. You if you grew up inside the church, I've heard a lot of different people talk about prayer. And yet we talk about prayer over and over and over again. Why do we talk about prayer so much? Because probably, if we're honest, most of us are not great at prayer. It's one of those things that you're like, I know I should pray. I know I should do that. 
I rarely meet the person that says, hey, you know, there's a lot of my, my life that I'm working on that I'm not quite there. But you know what? I can check the mark on is my prayer life. I mean, I just pray with the best of them. Most of us don't. Why is that? Because prayer is hard. Prayer is challenging. Prayer is difficult. So how then do we pray? Well, the book of Nehemiah is filled with practical examples of how we learn how to pray. There's two types of prayer in the book of Nehemiah. He uses long-form prayers. Those are the prayers that you and I think of when we think of sitting down and praying by ourselves or praying in a group and spending an extended amount of time, five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes in prayer. That's a long-form prayer. But then he also, more often than the long-form prayers, uses these bullet prayers. These prayers where he's just shooting off a prayer in the middle of something, in the middle of an activity, in the middle of doing what God's called him to do. He's saying prayer after prayer after prayer. Uh, let's look at the difference between those two. So the two long-form prayers in Nehemiah, one is in chapter 1, verse 4 through 11. So you have this long-form prayer, and then it tells us that he prays for four months. He's praying and fasting, aligning his heart with God's heart. In addition to that, in Nehemiah chapter 9, 5 through 38, that's the longest prayer in all of Scripture is in chapter 9. Now, maybe you're here and you're like, well, I don't, I struggle with prayer. I, I sit down and I know that I should start my day with prayer. And so I sit down and I start praying and I close my eyes and I pray for everything that I can think of to pray for. And I look at my clock and it feels like it's been 35 minutes, but it's actually only been two minutes. And I ought to do Here's a great practical way to learn how to long form prayer. In chapter one, Nehemiah cheats. It's not an original prayer. Almost every word of his prayer in chapter one comes from the end of the book of Deuteronomy. And so maybe if you are struggling to pray for an extended amount of time, here would be my encouragement or my challenge to you. Take the book of Psalms and read that book as a prayer. Turn it every verse in Psalms into a first person prayer to God. Start just at the beginning of Psalms. Start with one chapter and read that chapter as a prayer to God and then go on to the next chapter. And every day, take a new chapter and pray that chapter as a prayer to God. Long form prayers are an important part of our prayer life, but way more than long form prayers in Nehemiah, we see these bullet prayers. All throughout the book, he's just throwing these prayers to God. Now, Paul picks up on this same concept when he writes to us in 1 Thessalonians. It's the shortest verse in all of Scripture. It says, pray continually. Some translations would say, pray without ceasing. And I remember as a kid in church hearing that verse, and I thought to myself, that sounds awful. I'm supposed to pray all day, all the time, nonstop? I mean, I just remember as a kid at the dinner table, I'd be praying and there'd be food right in front of my face. I could smell it. It's right there. And depending upon who in my family prayed, it might be a 30-second prayer or it might be a three-minute prayer. And I remember one of my siblings, I mean, they'd be praying for orphans on the other side of the world and for world peace. And the whole time, I'm just, I'm not agreeing with the prayer. The whole time in my mind, I'm like, can you please say amen so I can eat? And so as a kid, this thought of never-ending prayer was like, whoo, that sounds awful. Until you realize what Paul is talking about. Paul is saying that we should live in an attitude of prayer. That, that we never step out of prayer. That, that our life stays in conversation with God. And we see Nehemiah practice this. That, that he's saying these one-sentence prayers as he goes about his life. If you're a Christian and a believer in Jesus and you have the power of your Holy Spirit in your life, what does that look like? Well, it means that I need to try and continually maintain that conversation with God. It might be that you're about to go into a really hard conversation. Maybe it's a conversation uh, with your spouse and you're trying to resolve some conflict. Maybe it's a conversation with a coworker. Maybe it's a conversation with a neighbor that you really don't like that neighbor. They're walking into that conversation. You're just saying a bullet prayer. Lord, help me in this conversation. Maybe it's while you're driving. That as you're driving, maybe you're someone that like me, you can get frustrated while you're driving. Because I have a high sense of justice, a high sense of right and wrong. And some people drive wrong. They just don't understand the way they're supposed to drive. And so a bullet prayer can help 
you maintain the right attitude and heart while you're driving. Lord, bless this man who has just cut me off. Lord, bless that person. God, bless this person in the slow lane that doesn't understand that the lane that they are in is actually supposed to be for passing, not going 10 miles under the speed limit. Lord, bless them. Staying in an attitude of prayer. Let's look at how Nehemiah uses this exact form. In chapter 2, the context right here is that he's about to go into the king and have a conversation with Artaxerxes about what's on his heart. For four months, he's been praying and fasting. And it says that Artaxerxes notices that his demeanor has changed and says, Nehemiah, what's wrong? So he has an opportunity to tell Nehemiah about his homeland, Israel, the wall is torn down. It says, then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now, Artaxerxes has just asked him a question. And Nehemiah doesn't say, time out. I gotta take a knee and pray. Hey, hold on a second. That's a great question. Let me go spend some time over there in prayer. No, that in the conversation, in the blink of an eye, after being asked this question, he says a bullet prayer to God, Lord, help me find favor with my king. And it says, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. He says a bullet prayer. It, it helps him to maintain that connection, that recognition that, that he's moving forward, but he doesn't want to do it alone. He wants to do it with God. If we really believed in the power of prayer, prayer changes everything. Now, let me show you three specific relationships that your prayer life can and will change. That prayer changes your relationship with who you pray to. It changes the relationship with who you pray with. And it changes the relationship with who you pray for. The more time you spend in prayer with God, the more intimate your relationship with God will become. In addition to that, the more time you spend in prayer with someone else, the more intimate your relationship with that someone else will become. Studies have found that if you pray with your spouse, the divorce rate gets cut in half. In half. That's a massive amount. Why? Because you have people that coming together are saying there is a power outside of us that is greater than us that is an authority over us, that you're knitting your hearts together as you focus on God. In addition to that, prayer will change the relationship of people that you pray for. Think about that person in your life that you just don't like. They just irritate you. Like every time that you are in a conversation with them, it feels like nails are on a chalkboard. Maybe this is a coworker. Maybe this is a neighbor. Maybe this is a family member. And Thanksgiving's not that far away. If you will start praying for that person, the relationship changes. Not because they change, although sometimes God does use prayer to change other people. Most of the time, the relationship changes because you change. Because you all of a sudden craft this empathy, this compassion for this other person because you're genuinely crying out to God on their behalf. Prayer changes relationships. And yet, most of us would say, I don't pray enough. I don't pray nearly as much as I should. Why? Because it's hard. We live in a world with cell phones, and cell phones are meant to give you all kinds of exhilaration that you get a dopamine hit in your brain, and so it's exciting. And when you're not looking at your cell phone, you also have a, a screen on your computer. And when you're not looking at that, you've got a tablet and you've also got a TV. And everywhere we look, we are saturated with things that are exciting to look at and fun to look at. And then we pray and what happens? Zoom. It's silent. And it's quiet. And it feels awkward. And we don't know what to do with it. So how then can I grow in my prayer life. Here's a really simple phrase. Discipline drives desire. What does that look like? That if I can create a discipline in my life to do this thing, then eventually that discipline will turn into a desire, a love of doing that thing. I, I tell new parents all the time that when you have a baby, one of the things that you've got to do is you've just got to choose to spend more and more and more time with the baby, even if early on, 
doesn't necessarily seem like a thing that you want to do. Uh, do you know that all studies, I mean, you look at study after study, overall life satisfaction and happiness, when you have a baby, do you think it goes up or it goes down? It goes down. Now, we don't like to mention that, and it seems like a pastor shouldn't even say that at church, because we like to think, oh, no, you have a baby, and it's wonderful, and woohoo, spirit sprinkles, yay. But that first six months to a year is rough. It's hard. It's really challenging. And I think one of the worst things we do to newborn parents is, is we say, oh, this is going to be the most wonderful season of your whole life. I wish I, could go to, I, I wish I could go back to having young kids. Not that first year. That first year is rough. It's just not fun. And, and there's something typically, and this is, this is a, a, a generalization, but, but oftentimes with the, the, the woman, I mean, you've carried the baby for months, and then you're breastfeeding the baby. There's an intimacy that's very natural. Oftentimes for guys, that, that's not the case. And, but we have this idea that, that when you have a baby, the first time you, you hold a baby, that like trumpets go off and there's confetti in the air and just like your, your heart just gets, gets magnetized to this infant. And I, I remember holding the uh, first baby and just it's like a slug. And it's all red and squished face. And, and, and I tell the advice I tell dads all the time, say, hey, sometimes you're going to hold that first baby and it's not, it, you're not a monster if you don't fall in love with the baby the first moment. But here's how you fall in love with the baby. This is the phrase that I say all the time. Maybe a pastor shouldn't say this publicly, but I, I, I say to dads, I say, you need to fake it until it's real. I say the same thing to mom. You hold that baby and you love that baby and you spend time with that baby. And at some point, one day, unbeknownst to you, you'll wake up and you say, I actually love holding the baby and spending time with the baby and hanging out with the baby. Even if it didn't start that way. Prayer is the same way. That you fake it until it's real. Your discipline, say, I'm gonna create times and avenues in my life to pray. I'm going to set reminders to remind me to keep that attitude of bullet prayers throughout the day. And that discipline will eventually lead to a desire, a love of praying. But nobody starts there. I've never met the person that just says, man, I just, I became a Christian. And the next day I was praying three, four hours a day, just staying in an attitude of prayer all the time. And I love it. Oh, it's the most amazing and exciting thing for me. Never met that person. But I have met people that ended up there. How? Through discipline. It turns into desire. So Nehemiah, throughout the entire project of the wall, is continuing in this attitude of prayer. We see it over and over and over again. But he doesn't just pray. He also has this pursuit of the vision that God has given him. That's what we see in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9. It says, and we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. So there's this idea inside of chapter 4 specifically where there is opposition that has come against Nehemiah. People want to kill Nehemiah. They want to destroy the wall. They want to destroy everybody inside the city. And Nehemiah prays, God protect us. But he doesn't stop after the prayer. He both prays and, what does it say, he also sets a guard as protection. Now, is that because he doesn't trust God? No, he trusts God. Hey, God, you're in control. I believe that you can protect us, but I also recognize that you have given us the responsibility to pursue that. And so we see two things at work in his pursuit of the vision that God has given him. The first is trusting God. We see this throughout this chapter. Verse 9, and we prayed to our God. Verse 14, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Verse 15, God had frustrated their plan. Verse 20, our God will fight for us. Now, look at verse 20. Our God will fight for us. So that's the mentality. We're praying to God and we're trusting God. Sometimes we don't pray enough. Sometimes we take on challenges entirely by ourselves without trusting in God. And Nehemiah really clearly demonstrates to us that part of us pursuing the vision, the goal that God has given us for our life is to trust God, trust in him. God is at work in this. But also, God expects us to take action. Look in the same chapter at some different verses. Verse 9, then set a guard as a protection against them day and night. Verse 14, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Verse 17 and 18, 
Each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. Verse 23, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. There's this idea that, hey, we're, we're trusting God. We're believing in God. We're praying to God. But we're also going to do our part in protecting what God has told us to protect. We're going to carry our sword. We're going to work. It's this delicate balance that exists inside the Christian life that I think that oftentimes we get wrong. Oftentimes, either we put everything on God and say, okay, I'm going to just pray for this problem and expect God to fix it. Or we ignore God and say, I'm going to take it on by myself. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to go after it. God's given me the ability, and, and so therefore I'm going to use that ability, and we don't pray to God at all. But what does Nehemiah do? He balances those things perfectly well, so often in the church, we do a bad job of it. There are, are pockets inside the church that, that practice a really bad, silly, stupid, false teaching. That they say, well, you just need to pray about it and, and let God do the rest and, and ignore anything that, that is your part to play. And so I, I've known people that had a really bad disease, something like cancer. And their advice from a pastor or from the church was, hey, you don't need to seek medical treatment for that. You just need to pray. And if you have enough faith, that God will heal you. Is that what Nehemiah chapter 4 is telling us to do? No, not at all. Well, what's Nehemiah chapter 4 telling us to do? It's saying that you should pray. We sang this song today, more than able. Trust that God is able. Have faith in God. Believe in God. But simultaneously, what should you do? Do your part. Go to a doctor. Get the medical advice, get the treatment, hold both of those things simultaneously at the same time. I've talked to people before in marriage counseling and they say, our marriage is falling apart. We're barely holding it together. And I'll ask them a question. Okay, so what are you doing about it? Well, we're praying. We're praying that God will fix it. It's okay, that's good. That's a foundational piece. You need to be praying about it. But what else are you doing about it? Well, that's it. Well, you need to do something else. You need to go to a counselor. You need to get into a program. You need to be actively pursuing it. You talk to people inside the church. They say, oh, I've got a friend that's lost. They're not a Christian. Well, what are you doing about it? Well, I'm praying for the person. Well, right, but, but what about your part of it? Are you actively engaging with that person in conversations? Are you actively inviting that person to participate in different things that are happening at the church? Talk to people that didn't have a job or trying to find a job. And they, they say, well, I, I feel that God is going to bring the job to me. I'm just praying that God opens that right door. And I'll say, you need to pray and you need to be on your face praying. But you also need to make a resume and go to some job interviews and start doing some work. I've talked to people who were single before. And they say, God, I just want you to bring me the perfect spouse to my doorstep. And when God does that, I will find Mr. Wright or Mrs. Wright. It's going to be an amazing, beautiful thing. And I'll say, well, are you going on any dates? Well, no, I'm just praying every day. The Prince Charming just walks into my life. Like, well, you should pray. And you should also date simultaneously at the same time. Both of those things work together. But we often fail on one side or the other. There's this visual that he says here up on the wall, that, that he says that, what do the workers do? That they were holding two things simultaneously at the same time. It says it right there in verse 17. It says, each labored on the wall, on the work. And then it says that with one hand, they held their weapon, and with the other, they worked on the wall. Both things, simultaneous. And now understand the balance between those things. If they said, okay, we're going to pray to God, and we're just going to completely trust God, and we're not going to do anything about it, then what would they do? They, they'd put down the sword because they said, we don't need to protect ourselves. God's got that. We're just going to focus and work on the wall. If they did that, what would have happened to the wall? Would have got destroyed. People looking up at the wall would have said, hey, they don't have swords. They're defenseless. We need to go attack the wall. Now, what happens if they do the opposite? If they're so scared, and they say, okay, we, we've... We're not going to pray to God. We don't, we don't trust that God can protect us. And they're going to be so scared. They're going to so focus on the sword that they're not going to do any work. 
They're not going to accomplish what God has called them to accomplish. In your life and my life, it's the same thing. That sometimes I don't focus on God at all. And I'm just trying to do all the work by myself and focus it entirely on me. And sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes I do focus entirely on God and I'm not doing anything. I'm just saying, God, I want you to miraculously fix everything for me. God, I just want you to be the one that solves all of my problems. And God gives us this picture in Nehemiah of both things. They worked on the wall with one hand and had a sword in the other. They trusted God, but they also took action for what God had called them to be responsible for. In the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology, they write, people are generally motivated to cultivate and defend a positive self-image. One common way that people protect their self-image, especially when threatened, is to blame other people and or external circumstances for their failures in order to avoid having to admit the painful truth that they are responsible for an undesirable outcome. How often do we do that? And see other people do that in life. We don't take responsibility for our actions. We don't take responsibility for our circumstances. We just follow in them. Multiple generations had tried to rebuild the wall and they failed. Why? Because they met opposition. And the opposition was challenging. The opposition was difficult and eventually they gave up. What does Nehemiah do? Does he not face any opposition? No, he faces more opposition than anybody else. Why? Because he was doing it. But he didn't have a victim mentality. He didn't blame the circumstances. He didn't say, oh, woe is me. Look how hard this is. I might as well quit. No, he kept on going. He trusted in God, and he also did the work. The great theologian Rocky Balboa, in one of his movies, not Rocky 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This was the next Rocky about Rocky and his son. He says this in the movie. He says, and when things got hard, you started looking for something to blame like a big shadow. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are. It will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's the Christian life. No Christian should be surprised when we encounter pain and struggling and difficulty in this life because the Bible tells us to expect it, to be ready for it. And so what do we do? We encounter challenges and difficulties. We hold both things in our hands simultaneously. I'm going to trust God and I'm going to do the work. I'm going to pray to God and cry out to God and I'm going to do the work. Both of those things as we pursue the vision, the goal that God has for us. So Nehemiah, he demonstrates this lifestyle of prayer. He has this pursuit of what God has given him a vision to accomplish and do. And then ultimately, he understands his priorities. Look with me in Nehemiah chapter 6, the first four verses. It says, now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I built the wall, and there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together at Hakafirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do harm to me and I sent messengers to them saying, and if you underline phrases, this is one of the most profound verses in all of Nehemiah. His response to them is, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Let me read it again. He's up on the wall. He's working. The wall is done, but the gates are not. A wall without gates is a worthless wall. The distraction is coming. They keep trying to get him off the wall. And he says, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? And they sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. Four different times. He said the same phrase. What was his phrase? I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. 
let me ask you a really important question in your life. What's the wall that you're building? What is the great work in your life that you don't want to be distracted from? Here's a good way to figure out what your great work should be. At the end of your life, when you're looking back on your life and you're prioritizing what you wanted to accomplish, you wanted to be, those things that are the most important to you then should be the things that are the most important to you now. That your great work, depending upon your season of your life, it could be your marriage. Hey, this is a great work that I've got to focus on and I cannot come down from it. It could be your kids in your stage of life. This is a great work. I'm focused on it and I cannot come down from it. It could be the calling that God has placed on your life. You using your giftedness for the kingdom of God, serving in missions and manna and youth ministry and kids ministry, mentoring and discipling, pouring into that next generation. There's lots of different things that could be vying for your time, but you say, hey, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down from it. The things that distract us from the great work are the enemy of the great work. There's nothing in this life that is worth accomplishing that doesn't require facing opposition. But the opposition that I feel like we so often face is just distractions. We're never distracted from good things into better things. Have you ever noticed that? We're always distracted from good things into things that just try and waste and kill our time. Spending time with my kid spend time with my family, spend time with my spouse, and what does my phone do? Does it distract me for something more important than what I'm doing? No, it's a distraction into something that's worse. How does Nehemiah accomplish the vision, build the wall in 52 days? Nehemiah knew his priorities. And over and over again, although there were distractions, he said, I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. What is a priority? It's something that we decide ahead of time. Prior to the conflict, prior to the ultimate decision, we've decided these are the most important things. And because they're a priority, I'm going to make sure that I don't miss it. Remember, there are no miracles in the book of Nehemiah. Sometimes it would be easier in my life and your life if, if there were big miracles, right? Right? It would probably been way easier for Nehemiah if God just supernaturally caused a tornado to pick up rocks and stack them on top of each other. And that, that wall just built itself. It would been easier if God just sent a fire that destroyed all of his enemies. But that's not how God determined to do it. And most often, the same is true in your life and my life. And so then what do we do? We pray. We live an attitude of prayer. We pursue the purpose, the call that God has on our life, the important things that God has placed inside of our life. And then ultimately, we live with this understanding of priorities, this phrase that I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you that you in your divine sovereignty created each and every one of us for such a time as this that there are no accidents, that every person in this room has a purpose you created our lives for, for this season, for this time, for this moment. God, help us to not miss it. Help us to be a people who pray, a people who pursue, and a people who have the right priorities. It's the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.